we can start uh, on time and people uh, can come as they come. So I'll go ahead and mute everyone and we'll just dive right in. So we, yeah, we've been having some, some uh, more political or, or sort of difficult uh, topics coming up recently. Uh, and I thought maybe we need a little bit of break into uh, bodies, animals, and the earth, something like that. So, so uh, we'll look at body, and that's uh, you know why we are why we are in this body. And uh, Ibn Arabi has a lot to say about that. Uh, look at animals, look at earth, and take it from there. So now this so uh, while preparing for uh, my talk tomorrow, which uh, has this very interesting um, uh, put the pivot uh, involved, I came across this passage again and just thought this was, uh, just really felt very, very suitable, something that we should look at now. So this is about the furthermost uh, pivot or Qutub. And Ibn Arabi describes him as being quick to marriage, desirous of marriage, someone who loves women. He gives natural needs their full due according to the limit set by law for him. And he gives his spirit being her full due according to the divine limit. So those two limits, the law limit and the divine limit, one for the body's um, actions and one for the spirit's action. He goes thirsty in emergency situations, not by choice. And he restrains himself, not by choice again, from marrying if he does not have sufficient, which means dowry to offer, if he doesn't have enough wealth to offer. He knows something about the tajalli of marriage that rouses him to seek it and be passionate about it because nothing verifies for him or for other arafin his slavehood more than the verification of slavehood sex provides him. So uh, we'll, be, we'll be looking at a lot of sex today, uh, but you can also be reading that um, love has the same kinds of uh, effects as sex does. So we'll be, so you can kind of uh, look at this as sex or the uh, insanity of love. Uh, both of those will provide us the slavehood, the abil ability to understand our slavehood, our ubudia. Okay. So now this, so this pivot, he does not desire marriage for progeny. No, it is for mujarad al shahwat. Now this word keeps coming up uh, in Ibn Arabi, the mujarad al shahwat. And so I wanted to look more about what mujarad means. And mujarad and tajrid, it's the idea of stripping and peeling off and that kind of thing. So you peel off until you reveal the shahwat, uh, like a, a sword is unsheathed, and then that reveals the, sh the sword, which is the shahwat. So it's a way to remove the coverings of your passion and, and your yearning and, and, and desires. And so, uh, but then it also has this very technical and uh, visual uh, metaphor of hitting the bowstring with this wooden mallet to release the seeds from the cotton. So we can be thinking of it, Ibn Arabi is seeing it as this beating of the this bowstring with the wooden mallet. And of course, we've looked at the bow and the bowstring before very much. So it's a, it's a very interesting uh, visual that, that he gives us with this word, mujarad al-shahwat. So this pivot makes sexual reproduction present in his mind, but only because of the law. And that's because the law uh, tells him that uh, have sex for rep reproduction, and so he keeps that in his mind. However, because sexual reproduction in marriage is for the nature-based situation, to preserve the continuation of the species in this world. But for someone of this station, sex is like that of the people of the garden, that is for mujarad ashahwat. So the people of the garden are having sex as a mujarad ashahwat, as a way to um, hit the bowstring with a wooden mallet to release uh, pleasure and yearning and desire and gratification of appetite. So he tells us more about what this, what this Qutub is learning uh, from, from this Tajali. So let's, let's look at that. I have to move something around here. Okay, here we go. So he says, you see, it is the greatest tajalli, which is hidden from the weighty ones, the humans and the jinn, except whoever God has specially singled out to see, it, see its tajalli among his creatures. So 
everyone except the humans and the jinn know these things. Um, and so that's why the pivot wants to learn them through sex. This is how sex flows with the beasts for Mujarrad Ashahwad. So they're very clear that it's for Mujarrad Ashahwad. But this truth is unseen among many of the Arafin. Yeah, Ibn Arabi will say this later also, that the beasts do that for, or the you know, animals or beasts do it for Mujarrad Ashahwad, and they're not thinking about uh, having, having kids. So, but this truth is unseen among many of the Arafin, the ones who recognize God. And so this is now the, the Gnostics. As it is one of the secrets that only a few among the people of grace halt at to learn. If there were not in sex a full high vantage position pointing to the weakness which slavehood, ubudiya rightfully has, except the force of pleasure found in sex, making one vanish one from one's senses and claims to be strong or claims to be you know, independent and great, it would be enough. It is a sweet, pleasurable force. You see, compulsive force negates pleasure for the one who is subjected to the force, except in this act alone. But the high vantage position of sex is unseen to the people. They consider passion animal-based. So there are a bunch of animals who, who do that, who, who have sex just for fun. They declare themselves free and transcendent from such passion, despite the fact that they name this passion for sex with the highest vantage position of names. That is their word, animal-based, that it's, a, it's an animal thing to do, animal-based. So Ibn Arabi is very clear to look at the concept of what the animal is, and haiwan, haiwan, and from hai. And even we have this in Latin-based languages, the animal is the one who has breath, has soul, is a living being. And we sometimes have animation so that you are moving and animated. So that's where we get this idea of animal. Um, but of course, uh, we've quite quickly forgotten that, that link of anim what animal means. And hai, hayawan, is living, and al hai is the living, a divine name. So this is a high vantage position. This name, animal, hayawan, is a high position. And it is uh, something that therefore to learn it is to learn to be an animal and what it means to be an animal. Okay. And these categories then come about. So we, we quite quickly move into categories like we're humans and they're animals. Um, and, uh, and, and so Ibn Arabi of course uses categories but always loves to put the intermediary in there, say that these categories, they are not fixed and that there are, there's bleeding on both sides. It goes, it goes across the boundaries on both sides. And uh, so this, the standard um, categorization of mineral, plant, animal, human spirit, he then goes and shows that between all of these uh, places, these categories, there are fully uh, realized beings who come between them. So the mushroom is between a mineral and a plant, uh, the moss, things like that. The date palm is between plant and animal, and he talks about other, there's a plant that puts down its roots and then moves and puts down roots somewhere else, and so it's moving like an animal, even though it grows also like a plant. Then the animal-human uh, intermediary of the, of, of the ape, and then the spirit human intermediary of Jesus. So these, these are figures that remind us about our fixed categories, that they're not so fixed and they're not, and they're not so clearly demar demarcated. And uh, if in the late 19th century, when the British were doing their census in India, they had to come up with another category called the Hindu Muslim, the Hindu Muslim. And so there were many. Uh, Tribe, tribes or indigenous people or groups or communities and, uh, and they call them Hindu Muslim because they couldn't put them in one category or the other. So they made a new category called Hindu Muslim. So this other category also works uh, just within the, in the, human, the human morphology and the human um, uh, characteristic. And so I'll, we'll repeat this. Uh, passage that Ibn Arabi talks a few times about the Huntha, the 
people who are intersex. And so that's a way of helping us see that there are not two categories, you know, binary, but there is a spectrum of, of, of human uh, sexuality and of human uh, biological sexuality and then human um, um, non-biological sexuality. So what happens uh, nature-wise and then other than that, spirit-wise. So Ibn Arabi says, we have spoken in our book on sexual reproduction about this, that in fact with the woman and the man, when if neither one of the two reaches ahead of their partner in the descent of the fluid, and the two descend simultaneously, such that the two commingle, and one of the two fluids does not attach above the other, he's, he's got a, he has a very clear picture of what happens in, the, in this process. Then, if it happens according to this format, God creates the Huntha, so that's the intersex person, the Husra in the subcontinent. And he combines the male and the female. If the two are equal in all facets and in exact balances, without a sloping away on the part of either of the two, so completely down the middle and no bifurcations ever, the Junta menstruates from his vulva and ejaculates from his penis. He produces children and receives children from the one who has sex with him. The story is told that there was a man and with him were two children, one of whom was from his loins and the other from his belly. If the fluid slopes away from the exact balance, and so now we have a bifurcation at a late stage, um, and it slopes towards the height, so if it is the fluid of the woman, the junta menstruates but he does not ejaculate sperm, and if it is the fluid of the man, he ejaculates but does not menstruate. So all of this is, so exalted beyond is who, subhanahu, the measuring apportioner, the creator of perfect apportions, the all-knowing. This is one of the most wondrous of intermediating membranes, the barazich, barazach in um, animal, hayawani life. So all that, this is all so that you would know that God is over everything, the measuring power, and that God has encompassed everything with knowledge. So Barazik. Um, so this entire story of how human beings have these uh, non-categorical, non-binary existences tells us that there is behind all of this a measuring apportioner, that the divine has measured everyone exactly. So everyone is exactly the way they are supposed to be. And the way they're supposed to be is for the re everyone else to see that this is the way they are supposed to be. And it is proof or signs that God is all measuring and apportions in a beautiful and perfect way. And all knowing knows what is going to happen. So these didn't, it's not a random event that the fluids of the man and the woman might come down in different ways. This is not an, a random event. So all-knowing, and that God is over everything, the measuring power, and encompassing everything with knowledge. So I wanted to stay a little bit longer with uh, the animal uh, aspect. And this, uh, too, that when, when, we, when I am translating on, for Hajj, uh, these words, korban and, and sacrifice and immolation, all these things, uh, and, and people will say slaughter in English, you slaughter the animal, things like that. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real misunderstanding then of what Ibn Arabi is saying, because this is what he is talking about when he talks about korban. So korban is the thing that brings you closer to God. Korba is close, and korban is that which brings you closer to God. And so this is from the chapter on the Hajj, which our editor Rowan is just now finishing up. Uh, then you sacrifice or emulate, emulate an offering, a korban, intending by that the release of the spirit breath of this animal from the prison of this oppressive natural skeletal configuration to the higher realm, so that animals to have his spirit move to the higher realm, the universe of expansion and goodness. You see the animals, all of them, according to us, are spiritual beings with intellects with which they understand God. And this is why he said about them, each knows his prayer and his celebration, his tasbih. So each animal has his salat and his tasbih. Thus, we release the spirits of these animals on this day, thanking God, just as we ourselves are extracted on this day from the state of restriction, and that is the ihram, 
in which we are. So when the pilgrim uh, enters the sacred, they, they, are, they are bound from doing other things, different things. And so that bindingness, that restriction of being in the status of, uh, of holiness of ihram for the pilgrimage, then gets loosened uh, when they go back into the profane life, as it were. To the loosening that it, and entering to the profane, to profane life and the performance of the permitted things, which brings us closer to God by way of choosing which permitted activity to perform. So even when we leave the sacred aspect of ihram and we go into our normal life or our profane life, we get closer to God by choosing which of all of the permitted things we may do, which will bring us closer to God. Then we eat of them, so there may be a part of them for us, so that we may see what dhikr of Allah, what dhikr Allah, the animal had particular to him as a tasting. So what did this animal have as his own dhikr Allah, his own remembrance and dhikr of Allah? so that we will make him like an assistant to us for what we desire for him in obedience to God. And certainly there's nourishment. So taking this kind of nourishment is best. So in other words, do we need nourishment in order to continue to obey God and in to stand up in the night and pray and to do all the things that we need to do to help out our, the people around us and the, and the animals around us and the minerals and the plants and so on around us. And here's a rare passage, one of the very few times that Ibn Arabi just gets pretty irritated. So here is his irritated passage. If you say, because all this animal talk, if you say, but our speech is the true one, we say, speech then is just that speech you affirm for yourself. So you're just saying they can't speak because they don't speak like I do. Well, you're just saying your speech is the speech that you affirm for yourself. And if speech, according to you, is an expression of self-based talk, that is expressing what's inside yourself, then that is present in the animal. So there is the sound of the tomcat when he searches for something to eat. And a sound is a sound different from his sound when he is looking for sex. So he araba. Now this is beautiful because araba means he makes clear and perspicuous and makes intelligently Arabic. He puts the vowel signs on all of these things. So it's completely clear what he's saying. So he araba, his voice, about what his self is saying inside. So his voice is marked with the Arab vocalizations. All the vowels are marked in the Arabic of what this cat is saying about what's inside of himself. If you say, in fact, that which was inside itself was desire, it was not speech, we say, and it is the same with the human being. That which was in himself is a desire, and it is not speech. So... That's how he said, enough of that. And then we move on to. So this is, uh, now connect some of all this to the earth um, <clears throat> and why we are, why we are earth-based and what the specialness of being earth-based is. So he said, then when God desired to create us for his worship, so the reason we're here is to be worshiping God. That's why we are created. So then, when God desired to create us for his worship, he brought the path near to us. So he made the, thing, made the way to worship easy and close and near to us. Therefore, he created us from earth in the earth. So he created us from the, the earth, the soil, in the earth, the mother earth. And this is the earth which God made lowered. So the earth is tractable. It's lowered so that you can step on her. And that's a very important aspect of the earth. And so to, to respond to, the, to the, um, the earth that needs to be, the, the earth that needs to be, uh, that is tract tractable and, and, and pushed down, we put what we think is the highest part of us, the sajda, the forehead, straight onto the earth to show as a healing for us to show that our high arrogance can be healed by the lowness of the earth, and it also is a healing for Mother Earth. So worship is lowering. Therefore, we are the lowered ones in root, that is, in earth, not at all resembling the one who is created as light, from light, that is, the angels. And he commanded his worship. So the difficulty involved in worship for the angels stretches far over them, 
on account of the far distance of the basis of light in those he called to his worship. So I've got these parentheses because Ibn Arabi doesn't want to spell this out for us, um, but I'm spelling it out for you. We're talking about the angels here. On account of the far distance of the basis of light, because they're light-based, in those he called to his worship. If not for God testifying for them, in that he created them in their proper stations at the commencement of their existence, and that they would not be descending from their, they wouldn't go down below their station. Thus, they do not have a worship in an ascent as we have. So we can rise from the such the where we put our highest arrogant part, which our brain, which we think is who we are and who we think is so great, we put that as low as we can, and then we're told to rise in the prayer. And when we rise, that's an ascent. They would not be able to capable of perfect fulfillment in worship because light has izzat, izzat has exalted pride, and it does not have zillat, does not have the low humility. Part of the grace of God for us is, as the intent of our creation is his worship, that he draws the path nearer to us, in that he created us from the earth, which in her we are commanded to worship who. So this is why we're created with earth so that the, it'll be easy for us to worship and it'll be natural for us to be worship. We will worship as nature intended us naturally. And this lasts for all of our existence after our pre-eternity, when we entered into the womb and into this world, we then are forever in either walking about upon the earth or we are in the earth uh, buried when we're dead. And that is our basis of worship that will stay with us through our entire existence, which has no end. Okay. And so this is the beauty of the veils, the beauty of the body. The, uh, and then the, the question here, will this will fly into the veils of creation? So at this moment, I'll turn this over to Baki and Nora. He's nightingale, stranger to space and time. I know you call the God and Lord, you resign. And I bow it, simply that a fair, all divine praise, bathing in bathing. Is not something comes more beautiful as long it goes deeper and deeper. Dervish singing is a concert that nothing surpasses this passionate love. This born lover. Questions of sorts of being, why the soul rise into the hand of creation? Oh, a light of supplication can flash from our eyes back to our eyes. Holy Lala, me, me. Shine, shine, in the youth just shining. Is their vision now complete? Nothing surpasses this fashion and love. Nothing surpasses this fashion and love. Beautiful, thank you. Um, so those are the veils all swirling about in this picture. <laughs> okay. So more about the earth and why we're the earth. <clears throat> then do learn, my friend, my sibling, that the earth of your body is the true, vastly spacious earth, which the true commanded you to worship him in. And this is because he commanded you to worship him in his earth, only as long as your spirit abides in the earth of your body. So when you depart her, this task falls off from you and is canceled. Simultaneously with your body being in the earth, 
buried in her. So do learn that the earth is not other than your body. And he made her vastly spacious, where he made her spacious enough for the perceiving capabilities and the meanings which you find only in this bodily human earth. Whoever does not worship God in the vast earth of his body, he has not worshiped God in his earth, which he was created from. In fact, God says, he who has made everything which he has created most good, he began with clay and made his progeny from a quintessence of the nature of a fluid despised. It is the fluid which wells forth from this bodily earth and pools in the womb of the woman. Then he evened it. So after evening the earth of the body and it's receiving the kindling by what there is in it, the wet and the hot, God blew into it and it was kindled. And so to uh, this pivot uh, above who, who you know, learns from sex, the, the weakness of slavehood of Ubudia, the humility of Mother Earth, the lowness of worship, all of this comes together in Ibn Arabi's, in a sense, uh, championing uh, a different kind of understanding of the divine. So instead of the divine as transcendent and so beyond, he's looking now at the one that is us and resembling of us. And in another passage, in one line, he just writes one sentence and he ends centuries of theological debate when he says, if God were not transcendent, we could not recognize him. And if he were not exactly like us or like us, we would not recognize him. So God has to be like us. If God is only transcendent, then we have no idea that there's anything here we're talking about. Or at best, we'd have what the intellect says, that there's no God but God. And we'd have just that. If God is exactly like us or resembles us or is like us, then we would look around and not know which one is God. So therefore, God has to be both transcendent and similar at the same time. So when you see anyone among the general population or among those who claim marifa of God, that is the arifun, Anyone praising God using transcendent names in the mode of vision, so that they see these transcendent names, or using names of doing verbs in the place where they are connected to another and not to himself. So this is the abstract, you know, someone else, God doing something to someone else, or God, someone else out there, transcendent beyond us and all of that. Then learn that he is not recognizing his self and he does not see her and he does not sense the impressing effects of the true in him. So in other words, what we need to know is not what happens to other people or what God far away is doing. We need to know what's happening to ourself, the closest neighbor that we have. And he does not sense the impressing effects of the true in him. So we need to, that the soul receives this impress of the divine. And whoever is blind to his self, she who is most close to him, then he is in the true dimension even more blind and more diverted in his way about another. He said, and who is in this world blind, meaning in the dunya, this near world, and he called her dunya, near world, because she is nearer to us than the next world, the akhira. He said, remember, you were on the valley side, which is dunya, meaning the close side, and they were on the valley side, which is kuswa, meaning the far side. So he is about the next world, more blind and more diverted of way. So then you should learn that you are part of the aggregate of his names. No, part of the most complete and perfect names, such that one of the teachers, and he is Bayezid Bistami, was asked by one of the people about the most tremendous name of God. He said, show me the least so that I may show you the most tremendous. Names of God, all of them are tremendous. So be true, haq and take whatever divine name you wish. I met the teacher Abu Ahmad bin Sayyid Boon in Murcia, and a human being asked him about the most tremendous name of God. He threw a rock at him. Then he pointed to him, you are the most tremendous name of God. Oh. Uh, now if we could have Hamid Anur with Veselahi. Secret glory without limit, 
mystic sultan secret glory without limit mystic sultan golden fountain rain of beauty illallah you only you my whole body is trembling my whole being my whole body is trembling my whole being blows like water we're swirling whirling illa you only you longing souls are water wheels turning turning longing souls are water wheels turning turning drawing love quenching thirst illa la you only you O Jarahi Nuradin, sublime lover, O Jarahi Nuradin, sublime lover, hear my moaning, dry my tears with illa who 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 O Dusuki. Ibrahim, holy master, O Dusuki Ibrahim, holy master, hear my calling, fill my heart with illa who 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 O oh, Musafa, blessed Ashki, pouring wine. O oh, Musafa, blessed Ashki, pouring wine. Light my body, merge my breath with illa who 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 Bones and muscles all have melted in your presence, flowing waves from all directions through your presence. Oh, the sweetness of your presence, illa you, only you. Thank you. Um, uh, one of the poems we saw before was uh, the oath that I passed by the, it's the lover's poem that Ibn Abi cites uh, more than once. I passed by the, the houses of Salma and I kissed the walls. And so his, his beloved, because his beloved is inside the walls. So you kiss the walls uh, because the lover who is inside, the way that you you see her and treat her and interact with her is through the body or the walls of the house. And in fact, that verse, verse, that poem first comes when Ibn Arabi is talking about gut bacteria. And he's saying that inside you, you have these tiny beings who have an amana to have a sacred trust to you. That when you eat something and drink something, that if uh, there's something harmful, they will, they will, burp it out or vomit it out and if it's something good for you they will process it and then you'll urinate or defecate at the, um, and so these tiny beings are there to um to they're helping us they are they have their sacred tr trust to help us and they help us physically uh, determines our health ibn arabi says and they they also give us a spiritual situation so Ibn Abi says it, it 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 tells us what kind of spirit we are in so we could say like emotional or psychological or emotional health and then it tells us where we will be on the dune when we are visiting and having the uh, vision of the divine and so these three um, these three results of these tiny beings inside our gut are are something that it's their sacred trust and therefore then it'd be our gratitude for for these tiny beings and so you know antibiotics which kill the bios that kill the life that's inside 
um, would that's that's up there something is wrong when we're having to do that and and so and when there's something is very wrong we have to use those medicines we want to find a way to bring back that bios that life that's inside so right after that he then describes he gives this poem and this is to tell us that the place that things happen the place of our interaction with the divine with god is in the body and because our body is earth-based uh, it's already primed and and ready for uh, worship and for even to be worship and love are the same thing and so it's primed to love god by having a body and so when we we cannot we cannot touch salma but we can touch the house we cannot go in we have inside of us we have the, the heart which is vast enough for the for for god um, and that can't be touched except through the body except through the heart and so this is the value of having a heart the value of having a body and the value of being in the earth and uh, ibn arabi quite clearly says that in quran and in whatever he writes feel art in the earth it's not on the earth it's in the earth okay so uh and now we have a song from farida from in freiburg in germany let's see if this works i practiced it last night to see if it works nothing is Thank you. So that was uh, that was our talking. Forty minutes exactly. How about that? <laughs> so uh, we can have any kind of comments or, or feedback and thoughts. Um, well, and you could be uh, putting in the chat. Maybe I could see that too. Um, but 
let's go ahead. I'll, I'll be looking at the chat right now, but also go ahead and speak up if uh, you have a, a, something to, re to respond to. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. Um, well, we well we have one one question about that transcendence and similarity idea, and this is the one that so if Ibn Arabi is saying that if if God were only transcendent, then we would have no access to understanding. There would be no, you know, if, so, if I say there's, a, there's something in front of you and it has no dimension and it has no uh, sensory output, it's not physical, it's not uh, imaginable, and so on and so forth, well, then I don't even know that it's in front of me. So in order to know that there's something, it has to be like me. It has to have physical or sensory or imaginable, something that is, uh, response to my reception that I can receive and, and understand. And so God has to be both transcendent and similar. And if it were only transcendent or only similar, if it only similar, then I wouldn't know which of all the things that are similar to me is God. And if it were transcendent, I wouldn't even know that there's a God to be looking at or thinking about or talking about. And so this is Ibn Arabi in one sentence so beautifully puts it together and, and solves three or four centuries of theological debate just like that. Uh, and he's very much, uh, in his, his audience, he's speaking very much about the earth-based of us. And, and, this is, and this is for those who, are, who tend to abstract too quickly, those who tend to transcend very quickly, or uh, become elevated very quickly. And he wants to bring us down and say that our highest place is our lowest place, the Obodiya and our earth. And so to be the highest is to be the lowest. And he really wants to remind his audience of that. And then when they say, well, we're, we human beings are so superior because we are made in the image of God and all of that. And Ibn Arabi says, you've got to understand what that means. Uh, and so, when then they say, oh, animals don't, are not like us, we speak. And he says, no, the animals have all the seven attributes or the seven sifat of God. They speak, they hear, they are alive, they have power, they have knowing intelligence, they have the seven. <laughs> and so, uh, so just like us, they have the seven. And uh, so there's, there's, there are none of these divisions. And that this category that we make might be helpful sometimes, but uh, in the end, we have to recognize that they're intermediaries. In the same way with biological sex, um, the, the, the fuqaha, the scholars over the years, will have to debate because in Islam, the inheritance, there's a male and female has different inheritances. So they have to decide when you have these intermediary people, you have to decide who's who. And so they have all these uh, complicated uh, ways of saying who's who. Um, and then in the mosque, Ibn Qudama says, the way you find out who's who is that as they present themselves, that's where they stand. And so in a sense, he, Ibn Qudama here would be saying that society has to recognize that, that there, everyone has a place. And the only question is, which is their place? So, and, oh, uh, yeah, this I don't know. The background, the Prophet Sallallahu called Hazrat Ali Abu Turab. Very interesting. I, I don't know anything about that. Dr. Uh, Kamali mentioned that. Well, I can answer that if you want. Please, yes, please do. What, yeah, so, <laughs> so, so Hazrat Ali being called Abu Turab, the father of, of the, the dust or the... The earth. Yeah, so this, this goes back to a narration that uh, uh, the Prophet was looking for uh, Hazrat Ali and he found him sleeping. Uh, and I, I think it was uh, on the side of a masjid or I don't recall the exact location, but he went there it was and he in saw Hazrat Ali. It was a masjid? And it was inside the masjid. Inside the masjid. So he goes there and he find Hazrat Ali sleeping and his hair is all uh, uh, covered in dust. So he wakes uh, Hazrat Ali up and in the loving um, uh, manner that uh, our Prophet Sallallahu had, he called him Abu Turab, which means the uh, father of dust. And uh, that, that's what, the, and that's where that uh, 
name came about and uh, hazrat ali liked it so much that uh, uh, you know uh, this uh, narration uh, uh, came about and then he he, he liked that uh, uh, from there so that that's the background Alhamdulillah. Very good. Thank you. Alhamdulillah. I'd like to add one thing. To, thank you for that beautiful account. Is uh, I've heard also that the reason he was in that state in the masjid was because he had had an argument, this is according to Muzaffar Effendi, with his beloved Hazrat Fatima, radiallahu an. And, and so out of that desperate state or, or down feeling, uh, he went uh, into the mosque and and maybe whether he intentionally covered himself with dust or whether he just fell asleep. Um, and then, as you say, the, the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came and said, uh, you know, rise up Abu Turab or come with me. Something, as you say, gentle and inviting. Alhamdulillah. Beautiful, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Aisha is asking a question. Does Ibn Arabi address how the reality of the creation being in constant praise function at the same time with the duty to strive as individual to be in praise? And this is, uh, Ibn Arabi will always tell us that our bodies are always in worship and our bodies are always conscious, uh, intelligent, alive, and that, uh, and then in order to kind of kick us in the back a little bit to help us improve. He said, he reminds us of the verse from Quran that the skin will testify on the day of judgment and the foot will say, here's this person, uh, my, my person who made me do these things and made me walk where I was not supposed to walk and refused to take me to the places I was supposed to be. So the skin and the bones and the, and the feet and the body have, uh, they are in perfect submission to Allah. And, they, and, and it's the one who is the guider of them, who it can be failing to guide them correctly or not. In the same way that the ruh, the spirit, is the guide for the nafs. And the nafs is, uh, her right is to be guided by ruh in a way that is good for her, that rights her instead of wrongs her. So this is how Ibn Arabi sees the two do things. So when he speaks to us, and so then he says at one point, he says, so therefore, do not let your skin be more intelligent than you. And, but of course, the skin is more intelligent than us, but we at least can be a little bit uh, shamed into trying to be a little bit better and closer to the skin's knowledge. Well, uh, Shweb, could we interject a question? Can the, you implied almost that the ruh could misguide when you said that the, the nafs deserves to be rightly guided by the ruh? Is it possible for the ruh to misguide? Oh, wait, I can't hear you. Yeah, um, yeah I think the, the, the ruh can, f cannot, can fail to guide. So I think, I think it's either it guides rightly or it fails to guide, which is wronging to the, wronging to the soul, to her. So, um, but in the good situation, like that, the, the first line that we had with that pivot, the Qutub, uh, that he followed all the natural nature and natural desires and things to do. And then, um, but within the, the boundaries that, that he's been given, the limits, and then the spirit also has things that it loves to do, but also in the divine limits that are given. Mm. Okay. Um, and we have from um, <clears throat> Khatija, uh, there's the, when they go to the mosque, which section do they go to? Well, this, so Ibn Arabi, uh, he doesn't get into this because he doesn't, he, has, he doesn't see this as such an issue as the, uh, like Ibn Qadama would have seen. So Ibn Qadama was, was coming up with how do you handle uh, the different ways that people present themselves. And so for Ibn Qadama, they have, he has that, um, the, the uh, arrangement of um, men in the front and then, and women in the back. And then, so he'll do, you know, the masculine males, the, the, the feminine males, then they'll have uh, a middle section of children, and then they'll have uh, femin uh, masculine feminine, and then a feminine feminine in the back. But this is because he's, he's trying to solve society's problem using the idea of where someone stands in a mosque. Um, but this standing in the mosque is, uh, 
is actually is a historical thing that uh, that came up in certain societies, but not all. And so it's not something that is um, that either is from the beginning or is necessarily something that we respond to now. So societies always have then the challenge of finding out where everyone stands. So, but for Ibn Arabi, he's kind of. Uh, Although he does, we do did some of that political things that he has for the most part. The only place, the only place that where you stand counts is where you stand with God. And so, other than that, he's not very interested. <laughs> so, well, thank you for that Abu Turab. That's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, it tells us that to to and and in fact, uh, I, you know, years ago someone was saying that 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 in some religions that your eyes are supposed to go up when you go into the temple or the, the mosque or the church, your eyes go up. But the, the real, the kind of the, the, the mosque idea is your eyes go down. And the mosque is the place of sajda, where you do go down. And uh, so this, this lowering the eyes and going down is really the, the, the key um, practice of, for the Muslim to understand his, his and her true place in society and in the creation. So. I just wanted to add the word um, Abu Turab is used in a lot of um, poetry by a lot of Sufi saints. Uh -huh. so it is mentioned in that. So, I mean, I didn't fully understand what he meant by that, um, uh, you know, when he called him that. And the other thing that was very interesting, you mentioned that um, you go down in prayer and that's and then you rise and that reminded me of the hadith of the professors and that uh, your mirage is through prayer ascension is through prayer so it just reminded me of that yes yeah, so, so in fact that the, the going down is the is the way everything starts to happen ibn arabi likes that second rising because he says you start out you start out standing up um, and then the second time you're standing up, he says, that's the most humble of the humble, because the going down, we're standing up when we enter into prayer, we're just standing up, we're arrogant and so on, and that's why we cover the head and so on. Uh, but that arrogance, then we go down to the earth and such stuff, and that brings us to our true natural bodily self, our earth self. Um, but then when, we're, when we rise the second time, it's because we are told to rise. So it's even more uh, Ubudiya, more slave, because not only do we naturally go down, but we went up only because we were told to do so. And so that is like a double humility that we were told to do so. So now we're standing up, not for myself, but because God told me to. And to learn that then is to learn the, co the connection between the creator and the creation. And this is our uh, this is our goal is to establish this, be, have this established connection of communication. And the way that that connection and communication takes place is our arrogant part hits the earth, which is the humble part. And then we learn that. And then we learn that not only are we earth, we are also subject to command. And then we rise up as subject to command. Yeah. There is um, there is there is a, a a poem by Rumi that came to mind earlier when you were talking exactly about this about about the sajda and then the coming up that it allows you to actually go up and um, and, and 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 in the poem um, somebody asks him he says show me the way to to heaven show me the way to the to the to, to the heavens and he goes uh, the ladder to the heaven and he goes your head is the ladder bring your head under your feet and when you put your feet on your head you put your feet on the head of the stars and then you can cleave through the air and a hundred ways of heaven's air become manifest to you you were flying through all the way up to heaven and it's just a parallel that came to me very much from uh, from that beautiful thank you yeah <laughs> one more question um you mentioned about uh, speech and animals and if you read a lot of literature you see that um, a lot of these saints and prophets were able to understand uh, what they're saying so so what is your understanding of that yeah yeah that uh, this it's very yeah that's that's one of the main one of the one of the ideas is that the that the sufis and and other uh 
kind of shamanic peoples and people who have these kinds of access uh, very much you know speak to the animals and then we have the uh, Solomon and 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 being a, understanding the articulation of the animal and the ants that that speak to him and all of that um, and so Ibn Abi says that you either know that by hearing so that uh, and then like the pebbles speaking in the palm of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says so the first the, the companions were there and the, and the first companion was invited to listen and he listened oh I hear them I hear their tasbih I hear them speaking the second one came and maybe the third one came but by the time the fourth one came couldn't hear it anymore and so uh, Ibn Arabi says so we know that the pebbles are speaking we know the animals are speaking either by kash meaning that it's it's unveiled for us and we hear it directly or by iman so faith that we know that they are intelligent and speaking and articulating the tasbih of Allah. So, uh, and so in a sense that having uh, iman, you see things by faith or you see things by kash, by, by being revealed to you. Um, but in all, in all the cases that we, Ibn Arabi says, in order to move forward, uh, we need to understand and, and listen for, for, the, for the animals and the plants and the minerals and, and on. And uh, so, so his irritation, I guess, uh, he does, he's, he, he picks, I mean, when he talks about the Arafin, usually Arafun is the people who recognize God, but sometimes it's the people who have that title in his society, and he's uh, getting frustrated by them not being able to see all the things that they should be seeing, so. You uh, Alex H is Hand has been up for a long time. Okay, yeah, know. we've got a raised hand over here. Alex H, iPad, okay. Salam alaikum. Uh, you can hear me, right, Shoei? Yes, uh, today's talk was, to me, more of a, uh, therapeutic talk as opposed to academic talk. In this time that we are going through, uh, you touched on several issues that were very heartwarming, at least to me. And I, I felt so much better after that 40 minute talk, as if some spiritual psychologist, you know, spoke to me for 40 minutes. The issue of uh, God imminent versus, and I wanna thank you for today's topic. Um, you mentioned God imminent versus transcendent. Uh, it's interesting, especially during the lockdown, we were at home watching all these YouTube and stuff. Some of the, and people like us, I assume other people in this uh, class, in this gathering also prefer spiritual videos and stuff as opposed to pop music and so forth. So there are spiritual teachers who emphasize the imminent nature of God you should be able to realize God right now, looking at the tree or looking at the flower in your house. They keep emphasizing imminence of God. And you don't hear them talking about transcendent worship or religion, or it seems like they dislike that. And then, of course, there's plenty of videos about the God being transcendent and unreached, out of reach, and so forth. And you touched on that. That was very, very helpful and good. Then uh, you mentioned... Uh, Kutub Mujarrad, uh, it was very heartwarming to know that there are beings in the midst of us, in communities, in societies, who are pivots, spiritual pivots, who are praying at the hard times, at the good times. We just keep forgetting about it. But knowing that here in Southern California, we may have a, a Kutub, and Abliya, who kept praying during those bad times, and still, you know, day and night uh, for all of us, uh, that's kind of heartwarming. Uh, and then the animals and plants. I had a couple of questions. One of them was regarding animals. Um, it's kind of academic question, not very spiritual, but it stuck in my mind every time I read Quran in certain verses, and I wanted to ask someone, and now you brought it up. Uh, for example, in Surah Ar-Rahman, it says, uh, On that day, day of judgment, uh, humans and jinn 
it mentions human and jinn, you know, they'll be interrogated not by asking them, but by their hands and feet and so forth and so on. And there are other verses in Quran that keeps talking about human, ins and jinn. Not, not once have I seen, maybe I've missed it as many times as I've tried to read, read, read Quran. Not once I've seen animals being on the day of judgment uh, or plants, yet there are spiritual teachers on TV and YouTube uh, who say that uh, on the day of judgment, there's going to be all the animals, all the, you know, sometimes we hear that a lion went crazy in Africa attacking people or some this and that, uh, behaving, you know, unrationally, so forth. What's Ibn Arabi's position on that? And then I have another question. If, I don't know if I should ask now or later. Well, yeah, I'll start with that. Yeah, the, 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 what's so interesting when you're saying about the, the awliya, the friends who are, who, and, the, and the pivots who are around us all the time, see, they're so, they're so immanent or they're so similar, and, and Ibn Abi keeps telling us that they always do the same thing that everyone else does so that they don't look different, so they don't transcend uh, themselves. And, so, and that's why they stay hidden. And so this is why, yeah, there are people always around us like that. Um, and then for the, Ibn Arabi does talk, he said, of course, that all the beings have their, their ummas, their communities, their mother communities, and they all have taklif, so they all have things that they have to do. And so therefore, there is always judgment. But for Ibn Arabi, he says, you know, that, that because they haven't, they don't, they haven't been able to completely leave who they are, their slavehood, their ubudiyah, because they haven't left, their, they cannot leave their ubudiyah very well. Therefore, their judgment is not, you know, not to really to be talked about or mentioned because it's such a, it's an insignificant thing for them. Although they, so, but they will go to the different abodes in the end. They will go to the different abodes. Um, and so he does, he does talk about that. And this, and this is the idea of taklif in animals as well, that they have tasking things to do. Yeah. So. You, Abe, Ali Rahman's had his hand up for a Good. while. Yeah. Ali Rahman, please. Yeah. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, two things come from Rumi about prostration. One of them, he says that when you put your head on the earth, it's not just your head, it's what's in your head, leave it on the earth. And the other one that he says that prostration without the prostrator. Thank you. Very good, nice. That's, that's a lot to think about, <laughs> to meditate on. <laughs> And Shoaib, I love the uh, violet hue in your room. It's amazing. Yeah, we, we've Thank got. You. Yeah, I've got my my favorite. Uh, whoa, this is the uh, this is Kadi Kader. This is the the homespun that you find in especially in South India nowadays. Oh. And this one is very earth toned, so it's doing all sorts of who's on me. <laughs> Thank you. If, if there is time, I, I, I have actually um, a question that, that came to mind with regards, always with regards to eminence and, and, and transcendent. And there is something that, that, that I always think about, and I wonder if Ibn Arabi mentions it in these terms. Um, in, in, in terms of consciousness, seeing God as, as, as the conscious, like the conscious with a capital C, or consciousness with a small c and therefore transcendent and imminent, if you like. I always felt that things are there, you know, like we are conscious of them and therefore there is the order that moves. But then the fact that things are coordinated together, not through the individual consciousness of itself, so it's not through my consciousness of myself or the table consciousness of itself, Nonetheless, at a universal level, at the whole existential level, things are put together and coordinated, demands a transcendental law, a transcendent in this sense that it is independent of the individual consciousness that connects it together and allows it to be. The very order of the universe demands, proves a transcendence, otherwise it collapses. Things cannot be coordinated outside the individual consciousness of itself, including including minerals or plants or what have you. 
is, is that something that that is within uh, Ibn Arabi's writing? Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I think you have to keep going because I can't, I can't quite, that, that's, you're, you're getting very academic on us now, but give, uh, it, give, me, <laughs> a more, give me a more earthly way. <laughs> it's, yeah, I, I, it's, it's not, I, I don't know how to put it in, in, in different terms, but I don't mean to be academic. It's not anything that I read. Uh, I mean, I, it's, it's being conscious of ourselves or being conscious of is the very reason of our existence. We are God's awareness of his own knowledge. It is consciousness, awareness of his own knowledge. This is all we are and nothing else. Uh, we get confused by thinking we're individuals because of the veil and we know that. Um, and, and, and it is that consciousness that, uh, that, that, that keeps an order between things, keeps coherence, keeps universal laws that allows the flow and the evolution of things as they evolve in different levels. If consciousness was purely eminent, then only the individuals as individuals disconnected can evolve. So the stone can evolve as a stone completely disconnected from the rest of the universe and from the law of gravity and from what have you, and so the humans and so the plants and so. But that is not the way it is. The fact that it's a wallness that is interconnected demands a superior consciousness with a capital C that is transcends the individual consciousness that keeps it together and therefore you know the law and the order and the coherence of the whole totality cannot happen with the imminent the imminent will crumble no 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 law of gravity no no laws of physics will stand through anything that is imminent right well that that now okay now i see and that and we had that in that one slide and that is that what is the most tremendous name of god and so the most tremendous name, the Azam, the Azim, and the tremendous name, is the one that's most transcendent. So here, that, so it's all contained there. What is the most transcendent, beyond transcendent, beyond and sublime and transcendent name of God? It is you, the Imanit. It's your name. You are the most tremendous name of God. So right there, what is the most transcendent name? It's the most immanent name, your name. And so in one place, you have the, all the most transcendent with the most immanent. There can't be anything more immanent than my name or me. Um, and so, and there can be nothing more transcendent than God. And so the most tremendous divine name is your name. So that puts it right there together. And as you say, <clears throat> because neither, neither way works. They have to be exactly in the same place. Transcendence and amenities have to be in the same place. So that's it. You got it. <laughs> Beautiful. And, that, and, that, does, and that, that helps explain to me what, why my name is the most the tre tremendous name of God. There we go. Thank you. And of course, the, we, we did that a long time ago. I think uh, that it's in me or in the uh, indeed I am. And so we had that the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is, <clears throat> excuse me, he's giving his a, a dua. And at the end of the dua, excuse me, he tells, he says to Aisha, says, do you know that I, I know the name, which if I say it, you know, anything will happen, everything will happen. And I just said, tell me that name. And so he says, no, I, I won't tell you that name. And then she goes off and prays and does different things. And then comes back and says, won't you tell me that name? And he says, no, I won't tell you that name. So then she goes off and she prays. And he says, in me, indeed I am that I am. I pray that for you, Ar-Rahman. And she gives all these divine names. And at the end says, you know, tell me what it is. And then the prophet turns around and said, actually, you just recited that one name. And so the mystery is, which is the name? Is it Rahman? Is it Rahim? Is it Rafar? And it's in me. I am that I am. So that's, that's, she recited that name, which is the one, which is the secret name. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, Shway, are, are you free for another? I can't figure out how to put it on the chat. Um, so back to the earth. Um, 
how uh, I thought that the vast earth was created. Now, this is maybe from some gleaning in the in the Banarbi was created from after Allah created Adam and Eve, then the day tree, her sister or aunt, she's called again. And then there was a little bit of earth left over. And I and with that, I thought he made the vast earth, which sometimes sounds like a different place or a place one journeys to, to receive, you know, amazing events. But so I don't understand when you say it's, it's our body. So our body is that? Yeah, I mean, I'm still, I'm still, dealing with it in a way because he says because, so the vast earth was made from the the remnant of adam eve the remnant of day palm and then then the vast earth was made so adam eve the basis of adam eve that earth is all ends up being the tiniest piece of the vast earth and then the vast earth is this place that is vast it's if he says that the the ring tossed in the desert is like the the earth in the solar system and the solar system is like a ring tossed in the desert of the cosmos of the the footstool the kursi and the kursi is like a tiny ring tossed in the desert of the throne and the throne and everything in it is like a tiny coin or or ring tossed in the vast earth so it's at, so so on the one hand he tells us all these incredibly vast things that are unimaginably big and then he says your body is that and so he's really i mean the only way to look at this and so when so when we are the only way we travel in the vast earth is because we dream because we have a body and then when we die and in the earth our bodies are our anchor which allows us to explore this vast earth and so so this vast earth this other other place is actually not an other place because it is our bodily place. And so, and if you think about the, the metaphor I was, or the visualization, if you take, uh, put a, a sheet on the ground and rumple it up, um, and when you, when, you, when you rumple it up, um, you, you see these points coming up or these waves or these, these uh, ridges. And these ridges look like they're independent. And, they, and we look like I'm here and you're there and I'm sticking up from this fabric. But Ibn Arabi is saying, no, it's one fabric. So all of us sticking up are actually in this one fabric. And there is no cut or discontinuation. There's no severing. We are in one huge fabric of earth which worships God. And then the little piece of me sticks up and say, hi, here I am. And it's true, there is a higher I am, but that doesn't re, re, that doesn't for, that doesn't allow me to forget that I am in that beautiful, long, vast earth, and that's what I think is the therapeutic. It is it's so therapeutic um, for for us to be able to for me to be able to say, Earth, I'm Earth. I don't have to be any more than Earth. I can just be Earth, and that is why I was created, and that's how I love and how I worship. And uh, what a relief. <laughs> Yeah, and, and Patricia uh, from Australia said, we are God walking and talking on earth, combining transcendence and immanence. And so that's the most tremendous name is your name. And I just, I just have that, you know, in the West, we have that, you know, God sticks his hand out of the cloud. You know, well, if God wants to stick his hand and touch you, that's going to be through another earth being is going to touch you. And so there, there is no hand breaking through the, there's a shadow play. And if the guy behind the shadow play who's flashing the light on these puppets wants to talk to the people who are shadows, you can't break the screen and talk they, because we, you have to have another shadow talk to me. And this shadow has to be the one that says, I came from a place. And, and, and your intellect can't figure that out. The way these shadows move doesn't tell us. I came from that place, uh, from an ancient lineage, and this is where it's coming from. And now I understand, because there's no other way to speak to me except through a voice that I hear and, and someone who is like me. So that's and that's that's why we are so grateful that this that that's our communication. That's our our the point of communication is that that another shadow like I am a shadow says I've been there. I'm sent from there, and this is the way things are. Alhamdulillah. Uh, uh, 
Thanks, Shoaib. I just have a comment uh, uh, regarding the vast earth. Uh, it, uh, it, it says Arzul uh, Haqiqa, Ibn Arabi, the, the earth of reality. So how do you distinguish this earth of reality with our common earth? I, I, I realize that you mentioned everything is earth anyway. Yeah. yeah. So, so physically, or or physically in the cosmos, Ibn Arabi says that the the cosmos that the the farthest cosmos that we have, the throne, um, in the interior well of this throne. So the cosmos is in a sense like a cone, and in the interior well. So, but everything is in there except Mother Earth. So she is on the lip of this cone, and that's and that is and that so. And that is the Rahim, the womb, and the Rahman is settled on the throne. So the whole cosmos has the womb and Ar-Rahman with the two feet. So this being, being on the outside and on the inside means that she then is the largest, of, largest body because she's in the cosmos and outside the cosmos at the same time. And so how we work with all of that uh, there's our conventional sense of who we are and I'm an individual and I'm sticking up here. And then there is the sense that from the perspective of fabric, then I'm, I'm in this fabric. And so, and so to recognize, to, to visit the vast earth is actually to recognize that you're on the vast earth, that you're in the vast earth. So, so you, you, it's not somewhere you go, it's somewhere you realize that you recognize that I'm in the vast earth right now. And this is the physics and the mechanics and the way things work. So, yeah. Okay. You, if, if I heard you correctly, you mentioned um, that um, God touches us through another being, maybe I maybe I didn't quite get that. But so, what does what does Ibn Arabi say about our inner voices, or some people call it intuition? Yeah. So the the the, the ilham, this inspiration or intuition, ilham. Um, this this is a way that that there's communication from from both higher beings and from the divine. Um, that, but when we're looking at revelation and, and it's being spoken to by God, every moment we are spoken to by God to be and we are. And every moment that we breathe, the breath of our Rahman has made us breathe. And we have all, every moment we are being kindled to be moving and do things that, that, that have the fire energy. And so, um, so, so Ibn Ari said, this is the way things are, but we only typically recognize only some of it or a very small part of it. Um, but this, the, what you're talking about tuition and, and how, we, how we know things from the divine, that's what Ibn Rabbi calls the special face, the wajal has, the special face, which is in every created being. So every created being. So from the, from the ant to the whoever else, every created being has the special face, which is facing God. And then that's the direct link or direct communication to God. And so the only then question is, is our, do we recognize what our special face is learning and knowing in each tajeli, in each shining brilliance that comes? So, so for Ibn Arabi, it's like, it, you know, you want to see God? Well, you already see God. You just have to realize that you're seeing God. Uh, you want to uh, feel what it's like to be God? Well, you already know that. You just have to recognize that you know that. And so all of this is, it's, it's, always, it's always not, you know, you have to go there, or I have to be a better person, or I have to do this, and I'll, all these things will happen. No, it's just, it's right here. It's right now. And even when you have 19 steps and you have the ascensions and things like that, any of those steps can be flipped over and you fall right into where you're supposed to be. So, so that's the beauty of Ibn Arabi. Everything is right here. It's the question of, do we see it? And then when we see it, then we know where we are. So, so Alhamdulillah, thank you so much for all being here. Uh, we've got some other events coming up soon and uh, it's just so good to, to see everyone. And so, thank you. Uh, can I ask you about your schedule for uh, the rest of the chapters? Because there are 560 chapters yeah. in this, and, yeah. I, and it's a big commitment to take it on. Yeah. And I, 
Okay. We just got the second book in our hand, and uh, oh, you mentioned that the third one's on its way. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, the, yeah. We're we're fine. The the project is is moving along beautifully. Alhamdulillah, and uh, Allah is making all of this come out into this place here, this world here. Uh, we could look at say the the third, fourth, and fifth volumes, maybe in a matter of months. So maybe before the end of the year, um, and then long six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, could be early. Uh, you know, if things could move very quickly now, inshallah. So we'll we'll see how things are going. Um, my translation of of draft is up to somewhere like twenty eight out of the out of the thirty seven. So uh, we're we're I think I think we can see things happening quickly now, inshallah. So so beautiful things are happening right now in this world that have been tied together and, and organized beautifully in the other world, in the Barzakh, and now they are somehow trickling down into us right now. So Alhamdulillah, we're watching that happen now. So we'll keep you informed. <laughs> Thank you, Alhamdulillah. Barakah. Just, just one other, other thing is, yes, Eric sir. is going to be uh, in, in Oxford tomorrow. <laughs> oh, so he's making a funny noise. Hang on. Okay. Uh, he's going to be in Oxford tomorrow, mm -hmm. and um, can you hear me? No. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, good. Uh, and uh, uh, he will be talking on Eric. Your title tomorrow? Uh, something like the encircled places of the Quran. The yeah. uh, yes. At the same time as this, mm -hmm. uh, and I would like to invite anyone who'd like to come along. I mean, it's coming along for the. Uh, it's for the, the members of the societies in UK, Australia, America, uh, and Mia Satina, which is Spain, Italy, everyone. So uh, everyone's invited. The, if, you, if you write, to, if you want to get a, a, a link, if you go to events.uk at ibnarabisociety.org, events.uk, uh, it'll come to me and uh, I'll put your name on the list. So um, maybe see you there. Lots of you will be there already, but those who, who aren't, then you're invited. Thank you. Yes, yes. Yeah, that uh, I, I came across the, the pivot uh, quotation, working for this talk tomorrow. So you'll, uh, a lot of good things tomorrow, inshallah, too. Yeah. <laughs> we look forward to that. Good, good. Thank yeah. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Thank you. Can we do that?